All right, so this video is going to cover some of the material in chapter two. Um, but like I said in the previous video, I'm not going to stick too closely to the text here, uh, despite the fact that I've opened up on the text. There are really two innovations um, that uh, I want to talk about that come up in chapter two. But to understand the sense in which they're innovations, you have to know what they're innovations upon. And I already sort of told you this. They're innovations on classical utilitarianism. This is the view that Mill was brought up in. This was the view that his father, James Mill, and his uh, godfather, Jeremy Bentham, defended. It's the view that he claims, in a sense, he's defending. He doesn't distinguish between classical utilitarianism and some form of, form of modern utilitarianism. What Mill wants to say is utilitarianism all along could go beyond what its critics thought it was. But what really seems like it's going on is that Mill's just changing the theory. So classical utilitarianism gets put forward. It gets put forward as a principle of morality specifically designed to justify the kinds of political and legal reforms that the utilitarians of late 18th century and early 19th century England wanted to see put into place. They wanted more humane punishments for criminals. Um, they wanted uh, free trade, um, basically all sorts of restrictions um, on the economy lifted. They wanted, um, well, I was about to say everyone to have the vote, but nobody really wants everyone to have the vote. No, I mean, I guess some people want children to have the vote, but most people don't want children to have the vote. But the big debate among the utilitarians of the generation prior to Mill was between James Mill and Jeremy Bentham about whether women should have the vote. Jeremy Bentham thought yes, James Mill thought no. John Stuart Mill is going to follow his godfather and not his father in this. But Either way, all the utilitarians wanted the um, franchise to extend to uh, the poor. This was um, one of the big reforms of 19th century England was basically granting everyone the vote. It was, happened around the same time that this process happened in America. It's just in America, it happened more slowly. Uh, so like there's not one moment where the poor get the vote in America because it happens at different times in different states. Um, but in England, it happens. Um, there are reform bills where this gets passed. But their primary interest, the utilitarians, is politics and law. But they, like most people, in justifying the political changes they wanted to see made, um, made reference to a principle of morality. So the idea is this should be the law because this is what's morally right. Very common move to make. You might think it's the best reason to make a political change. Because what would the alternative be? If it's not morality that you're arguing from, is it just self-interest? Right? Uh, the utilitarians claimed to have found a principle of morality that was more than just them. They're asserting their self-interest. Right? And that principle of morality is really actually two principles of morality. Uh, Mill always refers, re refers to it as the utility principle, but it's very useful to break what he calls the utility principle up into two parts. And the two parts say, um, uh, the first principle rather, here, it's the same color. Principle one links the rightness of an action to um, the consequences of that action. So you can think of it this way. The better the consequences are of some action, either the more right it becomes, or you might think the more likely it is that it's the right action. So whenever you're faced with a choice, the way you should figure out how to uh, proceed is to figure out the consequences of that action and to um, perform the one that has the best consequences. Right? So that uh, per first principle is sometimes called the act consequentialist principle. Or that it expresses act consequentialism. Consequentialism because it says the rightness of actions or the rightness of something depends on its consequences and act because this is talking about a right action. As we'll see, uh, not in this video really, but in subsequent videos, there are other ways to connect consequences to um, moral rightness right? or your moral duty other than through actions, but put that aside for now. So the first principle just states act consequentialism. But it doesn't tell you how to evaluate consequences. It doesn't tell you what makes one consequence better than another. It just tells you it's really only the consequences that matter. Um, 
you've heard of this principle basically, by the way, under another name. Uh, it's the principle that the ends justify the means. Now, in general, everyone accepts that the ends do justify the means. If I'm thirsty and I go to my fridge and I get a Coke, um, the means is getting the Coke and the end is quenching my thirst. And obviously, my goal or my end of quenching my thirst justifies my means, which is getting the Coke. But what a lot of people think is the ends don't always justify the means. The idea being that there's some things that are in themselves so wrong to do that it doesn't matter how much good is being produced or what goal you're achieving by it. Act consequentialism basically just says, no, that, that's confused. Right? Um, all that it is for an action to be right or wrong or good or bad is for it to have better or worse consequences. Right? Everything is to be evaluated in terms of its results. But the first principle doesn't tell you what makes one result or one consequence better than another. So the second principle does, and that's hedonism. Pleasure is the only good, pain is the only bad or only evil. So that's classical utilitarianism. Mill lumps them together into what he calls the utility principle. So whenever he refers to the utility principle, he's really referring to these two principles put together. The reason it's important to separate them is that you can make changes to the first principle without making changes to the second and vice versa. Right? You could just get rid of hedonism entirely and replace it with um, some other view about what makes consequences good or bad, about what is good or not. And uh, you would leave principle one unchanged. Right? So the, this way of presenting it just makes clear there's really two parts to what Mill calls the utility principle, two fundamental ideas. In chapter two of, on utilitarianism, Mill is going to defend the utility principle. But he's going to do it by altering the second principle, hedonism. Some people think altering it beyond recognition. And he might be also altering principle one, although that's not as clear. But let's uh, start with hedonism. Right? So I want you to um, think of, if you haven't seen it, then go see it sometime. It's a major movie in the history of the film. Think about The Matrix. If you haven't seen The Matrix, you probably know what The Matrix is about. The idea is um, machines have enslaved humankind and they've put human beings in this digital simulation. And uh, inside the digital simulation, the human beings don't know that they're in a simulation. They think they're going through normal everyday life. But really, they're just um, a body uh, in like a vat providing electricity. That's actually a really stupid idea. Like, if we can make batteries, why can't these machines make better batteries? Um, anyway, uh, I mean, if they can make food for us to keep us alive, then why can't they just directly make the chemical ingredients necessary to make a good battery? Who knows why? Um, uh, but put that aside. The idea is we are actually spending our whole lives in a tub full of green goo with our mind directly hooked up to a computer and the computer makes us think we're living in an ordinary nice world. And at one point in the movie, one of the characters, uh, one of the human characters who's aware and ha of the deception and has left the simulation and is part of this underground resistance movement, a guy named Cypher, a spoiler alert if you don't want to find out what happens in The Matrix before you see it, go see it, stop this video, go watch The Matrix and then come back to the video. Uh, Cypher betrays uh, his fellow human beings so that he can go back in the Matrix. Uh, and as he says to the machines that run the Matrix, um, it's not like the pleasures of the Matrix are any worse because they're fake. Right? So the example he uses is um, he, uh, he's eating a steak inside the Matrix. So he is actually in like this resistance ship, but he's managed to find this back door into the Matrix to talk to the machines there. Um, in the real world, he eats nothing but like this disgusting gruel, uh, but in the Matrix, he can eat um, steaks. And he apparently really misses steaks. Um, and he says, look, this is, this is good, right? I, everything feels like it's real. And all the pleasures I experience, the pleasure them itself is real. Now you're taking pleasure in something that isn't, but the pleasure itself is real. You feel the same way eating the fake steak as you do the real steak. And what Cypher basically points out is this is what we really want anyway. Um, and 
the reason I bring up The Matrix is, one, it's a movie I think a bunch of you have seen, or you're familiar with the idea anyway. And two, it relates to a criticism made of hedonism. Uh, criticism made of hedonism long before The Matrix uh, was produced uh, and written. Um, in fact, there's some reason to think that people who made The Matrix like took a philosophy class at some point and heard about this example, because the example is the experience machine. So a philosopher named Robert Notzik in, I believe, the 1960s, no, early 1970s, came up with this counterexample to hedonism called the experience machine. And he said, suppose someone comes to you and they tell you that they have a machine that can simulate any experience you want. In fact, it can simulate any set of experiences. You can tell this person, this doctor, what you want, and they will get, go to their computer, they'll plug it into the experience machine, and then if you hook yourself up to the machine, you will experience that thing you wanted to experience. Let's say you want to climb Mount Everest, but you know it's dangerous and people die climbing Mount Everest. You also know it's like not nearly as romantic as it seems because there's hundreds of people climbing Mount Everest a day, and there's like this long line of people with their like mountain guides leading them up the hill and it's like a conveyor belt. It's like not interesting at all. But um, let's say you want to have the experience of climbing Mount Everest by yourself. But it's dangerous and you're not a good mountain climber and all sorts of things. But if you hook yourself up into the experience machine, you'll have the experience of doing that. You won't really do it. You'll really just be laying down on a bed hooked up to the experience machine, but you'll have the experience. It'll simulate that experience in your mind. Um, now, you might think, well, but as soon as I get un unhooked from the machine, I'll know it was fake. So that'll ruin it. Now imagine that the person says, I can actually hook you up to this machine for life. So you just tell me what kind of life you want to live and I'll, I'll do it. Right? Um, the question is, do you want that? Do you want to spend the rest of your life actually lying on a bed, hooked up to a machine, being kept alive by like an IV drip? And nurses come every once in a while and like roll you over and exercise your limbs and get bed sores and your muscles on atrophy, stuff like that. You actually are doing that, but you think wholeheartedly that you're living the life of your dreams and everything feels like you're living the life of your dreams. All the pleasure that would come from having the life of your dreams, you feel. Would you do that? Would you voluntarily um, take that deal? Right. Once you get hooked into the experience machine, you'll forget that you made the deal. Right. Everything will seem real to you. You're like your memories will stop right before you meet this doctor who for some reason has decided to make you this offer. And they'll pick up again once your fantasy life starts inside the machine. Would you do it? Notzik thinks no. I mean, most people, the answer will be no. Uh, it'll seem attractive at first, right? Because there's all sorts of things you probably think, well, I can't really do in real life. Um, so, uh, might as well do the fake version. It's as close as I'll get. But then if that's your whole life, right? Your whole life is you live for 20, 30 years or something, and you get to a certain point where someone says, um, I can hook you up to a machine where you'll spend your left rest of your life effectively as a vegetable, but your mind will be working on the inside and you will have all these experiences. Now, if part of your fantasy life is, you know, getting married and having kids, well, they'll all be fake. They won't be real, right? but you'll think they're real. And if your fantasy is involves like becoming the, like a great novelist or a songwriter or an artist, well, you won't actually make any like great art. You won't write any great songs or books, but you'll have the experience of people treating you like you did. I mean, not real people, but fake people. And Notzik thinks, if you really understand what's going on here, you're not going to pick that. You're going to want to actually do things. You're going to want to actually accomplish things. You're not going to want to trick yourself into thinking you are just so you can feel the feelings. So that's um, a problem with hedonism, the experience machine problem. Um, now, I've started out with the most extreme, or what most people think is the most effective and extreme criticism of hedonism. And it's kind of sci-fi. You might be like, well, what is this that we're talking about? An experience machine? So let me back it up a little bit and make it a little simpler. Suppose you don't run into a doctor who is like, I invented a machine that can give you any experience you want. 
Let's suppose you meet a doctor with a far more plausible story. And this doctor says, I've come up with a form of heroin that's safe. Right? You, uh, you don't die from it, and um, everything, everything just works out fine. You get the same high as heroin, but you know, your heart never stops beating because of it, right? And also, I've got a lot of it synthesized, uh, but the doctor needs to be able to show that it's safe. And he's like, he's already shown you the evidence that it's safe, but he needs to do the experiment on a human being or else people won't trust it. So he's willing to make you this offer. A lifetime supply of heroin. His new healthy heroin. Um, you can stay on a heroin drip for the rest of your life. You can be constantly high on heroin for the rest of your life. And apparently the heroin high must be really good because actual real world heroin that's bad for you, people still do it, right? Um, now the withdrawal can kill you and the withdrawal apparently, I've heard it, it's described as feeling like there's fire ants underneath your skin everywhere and there's nothing you can do about it. So don't do heroin because like one, it can kill you all on its own. And two, if when you quit, if you quit, like it feels like there's fire ants under your skin. So if you had needed to still be told, don't take heroin. Here's the message. Don't take heroin. This is pretend we're talking about here. I mean, healthy heroin, which doesn't exist. But suppose it did exist. And suppose this guy said, look, you spend the rest of your life on a heroin drip experiencing like the greatest physical pleasure possible. And you might be like, well, but what about, you know, I build up resistance to it. And the guy's just like, so I'll increase the drip, right? We'll start you out on one bag a day. By the time you're 70, you'll be on five bags a day. Who cares? I got plenty, right? Um, would you do it? Would you take this deal? Would you live the rest of your life on an IV drip of heroin? Healthy heroin, right? So you're going to live a full, long life. Well, maybe not full, but long, right? Not full because you're just lying in a bed, like, the whole time. But would you take it? You might think the answer is, well, no, right? Now, if the answer is no... Uh, to my healthy heroin example. So we've got two examples here. Healthy heroin and the experience machine. Now I'm going to come back to the experience machine in a minute, but let's focus on healthy heroin for a minute. If the answer is no to healthy heroin, then doesn't that show that hedonism is false? Right? Hedonism says pleasure is the only good thing. Like what's missing from the healthy heroin? You're experiencing constant pleasure. Like the only time you're not high on heroin is when you're asleep. Like maybe the machine shuts off for a little bit when you're asleep. Or maybe it gives it to you every like few hours. You like a constant study high or something. I don't know. I don't actually know how heroin works. But um, what's missing? If pleasure is really all that's good, it seems like you've got as much pleasure as it's possible for one person to feel. But nobody wants the healthy heroin life, right? Um, I mean, maybe a heroin addict would. If you tell a heroin addict, hey, I've got a kind of heroin that's safe, they might like do anything for it. But people who aren't yet addicted to heroin presumably aren't going to take that. Right? Um, and if that's right, if you're right not to take it, then it seems like there has to be something wrong with hedonism as a view. And Mill agrees. Um, if you had gone to Mill and said, I've got this wonderful kind of opium that doesn't make you sick. Mill would have been like, nah, man. And he would have instead said, you need more in life than just, you know, uh, getting high. Right? And this is part of the reason why Mill um, developed a theory called qualitative hedonism. His godfather, Jeremy Bentham, thought that when it came to pleasure, there was really only two important features. I mean, he, he had actually five, but like he was mixing things up. There's really two important features. There's duration and there's intensity. What Bentham said is every pleasure has a certain level of intensity. And you know, like, what you mean by that. Like, you've had the minor pleasure probably in your life of having an itch and scratching it. And then the itch goes away and you're like, oh, yeah. And you've had the pleasure of feeling like uh, sunshine on a warm day, like on your shoulders. And you've had the pleasure of being at a really cool party. 
right? And dancing around, and everybody's laughing and smiling and stuff like that. You've had the pleasure of eating really good food. You maybe had the pleasure of sex, right? You've um, maybe had the pleasure of uh, someone you love telling you uh, they love you back. Right? These pleasures have different intensities, right? Um, you take a second of that itch scratching feeling and you hold it up to a second of um, the person you love telling you they love you back. And there's a lot more pleasure in one than the other. So intensity is like how much pleasure is being squeezed into each moment. And duration is just how many moments does it last, right? Some pleasures are really intense, um, but they don't last a long time, right? Uh, so that sunshine on your shoulders, that can last a while. That's nice. But the itch scratching, I mean, about a second after you've scratched the itch, like there's nothing left, right? The pleasure is over. And itch scratching is both a low intensity and low duration pleasure. Whereas sunshine on your, sunshine on your shoulders is a low intensity, high duration pleasure. And this is what Bentham thought. It was really just, you know, amount of pleasure per unit of time and how long the pleasure lasts. That's really all there is to measuring a pleasure. And if you want to compare pleasures, you compare duration and intensity. Mill agrees with this. Mill thinks, yeah, this is, this is good, right? Um, this, though, tells you the quantity of pleasure. What Mill's going to say is in addition to quantity, we have to measure the quality of pleasure. Because when it comes to quantity, healthy heroin seems like it's going to squeeze as much pleasure into your life as possible. Because it lasts your whole life. Because this guy said, I've got a lifetime supply and I can get around that uh, um, uh, resistance to it uh, that you build up over time. I'm using the wrong word. It's not resistance. It's, but whatever. You know what I mean. You know, uh, as you go on, it takes more alcohol to get drunk, that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's got long duration, but it's also really high intensity. Heroin apparently has a really intense uh, amount of physical pleasure associated with it. If all that mattered was quantity, you would take the healthy heroin. You'd sign over the rest of your life to this guy to be his, you know, experiment. But Mill thinks that's not all there is to it. In addition to being, in addition to there being some pleasures that last longer than others and some pleasures that are more intense than others, there's some pleasures that are of higher quality than others. And he's going to have something to say about uh, what makes a high quality pleasure a high quality pleasure. But first, before we get to that, we need to have an idea about um, how the quality interacts with the quantity. And there's really two matters here. So like, let's say we've got two pleasures. We've got pleasure one and pleasure two. And let's say pleasure one lasts for 10 units of time, right? Um, 10 units of time. If, actually, let me draw this up a different way. Units of time, 10. Pleasure two lasts for five units. Let's say pleasure one um, has, uh, let's say units of intensity. Now this one's really artificial. With units of time, you can think to yourself, all right, this one lasts 10 minutes and this one lasts five minutes. That makes perfect sense. Units of intensity, like we don't have a scale for intensity of pleasures. Um, you've probably been to a doctor and had the doctor tell you uh, or ask you, you know, rate your pain on a scale of one to 10, where one is a minor pain you barely notice and 10 is the worst pain you've ever felt. And you've probably had that experience of like, I don't know, it's not a one, it's not a 10. Somewhere around a five, is it a four, a five, or a six? I don't know, whatever, right? It's hard to put that kind of um, uh, scale on a feeling like pain. It's gonna be similar for pleasure, right? but just bear with me, let's pretend that you can do it. And let's say that um, P1 has an intensity of six and P2 has an intensity of three. If it's just quantitative, we've got 60 to 15, pleasure one wins. But let's say we now come in and we have levels of quantity or levels of quali quality rather. And let's say that um, pleasure one is a low quality pleasure. It's at level one. And pleasure two is a relatively high quality pleasure. Let's say it's level three. Right. We'll see in a minute whether um, how many levels there are, Mill thinks, and like 
how you can measure this kind of stuff. But for now, we'll just say um, uh, one and three. Well, now we face an issue, right? The way we got to 10 and six making 60 was by multiplying them together, right? And five and three making 15. The idea is if you're getting six units of intensity per unit of time, and there's 10 units of time, you've got 60 total units of pleasure. Right? Now, what happens when we add in the quality difference? If it's just another multiplier, then what we get is 60 to 45. If all, if the way that quality matters is the same way that intensity and duration matter, right? It's just another thing to factor in. Then the difference in quality here wouldn't actually change which pleasure you pursue. It could if the number had been higher, right? If pleasure two had been at level of quality five, well then uh, it would now be higher pleasure two and overall pleasure than pleasure one. But I set it at three, precisely so that we would still get that pleasure one is higher than pleasure two. So if quality is just a multiplier, um, then sometimes you will pick the low quality pleasure over the high quality pleasure. The other way you could do it is by doing something called um, lexical ordering, where you say, all right, we're not going to just treat these three things, intensity, uh, duration, and quality, as three equal factors. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have a two-step process, right? Instead, we're going to have P1 and P2, and we're going to ask a first question, um, or actually, so I'm running out of room here, I didn't give myself enough room. We'll ask first, what is the quality level? Right. And we get to one and three. And then um, we just stop. Right. We see that pleasure two is a higher quality pleasure than pleasure one. And so we choose pleasure two. And you only go on to ask the next question, which is about um, quantity, which will give you uh, six and ten right, for uh, intensity and duration. It'll give you three and five for pleasure two. We would only go on to ask about quantity at all if pleasure one and pleasure two were at the same quality level. But if they're at a different level, then you don't need to think about quality at all. Another way of putting it is on this second model of how quality matters. Quality trumps quantity every time. The higher quality pleasure is better than the lower quality pleasure um, no matter how much of each you, um, uh, you're going to get. So, we have two models here for how quality could matter. We know that Mill, if you read the text, we know that Mill uh, clearly thinks quality matters. He clearly thinks quality matters independently of quantity. But there's a question about how much it matters. Um, the evidence seems to suggest that Mill prefers this second way, what I call the lexical ordering way, that you should always choose high quality over low quality. And in order to judge the plausibility of that, we need to figure out what Mill thinks the difference between high and low quality pleasures are. And that will come in the next video.